So about 24 years ago, I was working in a backyard landscape installation here in San Francisco for a local developer. Uh, I was out in the field with my crew. Uh, we were setting some boulders, and uh, we didn't have a very big budget, and uh, it wasn't really anything spectacular, we didn't think at that point. But we were working in the backyard, and um, in the middle of the day, a guy came waltzing in through the garage in a fringe jacket and a, with a bolo tie on. And, uh, and he walked up and asked me what I thought I was doing. And I said, well, I'm trying to set a boulder. And I said, what are you, what are you doing? And he goes, well, do you know who I am? And I said, no. And he goes, well, I'm the architect. And I reached in my bag that I had on my side, and I pulled out a crumpled dinner napkin that had a pencil sketch of some boulders and a, and a small stone wall on it. And I said, well, you must be responsible for this then. And he took it and looked at it, and he smiled, a big, broad smile, and laughed. And, uh, and then we got busy finishing up the boulders and actually building what he wanted to build for, the, for his friend Cy Pellets. And that was my first introduction to Larry Halperin. And it was the beginning of uh, over 20 years that we worked together uh, here on the West Coast building uh, projects for Larry that were in stone. Um, and uh, Larry's friendship with me was very deep, and he affected me a lot, both as a friend and a mentor. Um, Larry's approach to his work influenced my approach to my work and how I uh, think about stone today and how I think about how things should be built and why things should be built. And I ask those questions as much as I can. Um, Larry was born in 1916 in Brooklyn, New York, and he spent a portion of his teenage years in a kibbutz in Israel. And I think from my talks with Larry over the time that I knew him, that that influenced him deeply about his connection to nature and his connection to stones specifically. And I think that set somewhat the direction of his life. I think that was the beginning of his arc in where he was going. Um, I. He was deeply affected by the Depression and FDR's presidency. Um, this was another big influence on Larry. And uh, he went on to college, but after that he volunteered for the Navy in, in World War II. And not everyone knows this. He was uh, uh, on the USS Morris when it was attacked at Okinawa and sunk, and he was a survivor. And uh, from that experience, he came back to San Francisco and went to work with Thomas Church and um, that was kind of the first formal practice that he worked in. And then he moved on from there into his own practice. And during those early years of his practice, he spent a great deal of time in the Sierra Mountains camping and hiking and sketching. And I think that really those kind of events were what shaped all the rest of the arc of Larry's career and his life and, and his designs and his ideas. Um, I think that Larry learned a great deal about natural rhythms and forms in his time in the Sierras, and we spent a lot of time talking about that. Um, there was a great deal of discussion about uh, his belief that if we were going to work with him and create anything worthwhile, we had to understand his, his ideas about um, the way things are built, the way things are, uh, should be constructed, and the way places should be for people. Um, he. From my experience, Larry had really a, a number of things that he did that really added to his practice, and more than anything was sketching. I mean, everything started with Larry with sketching, and he kept a, a constantly kept journals, constantly drew, constantly sketched. And he would move up from the sketching into workshops. Um, and, and the early part of his career, workshops were not something that, I mean, they're done commonly now. They're, they're part of uh, quite a bit of the practice of architecture. But at the point that he started out, they weren't as common. They were kind of new ideas. And he was using these workshops in ways where uh, people would literally get up and dance and move and walk through these spaces. And they were really kind of testing the limits of things. They were kind of trying to figure out um, new ideas about architecture at that point. And it seems to me that in my work with Larry that everything came in circles. It was sketching, it was models, it was mock-ups, and then if the results weren't particularly good, uh, if he wasn't getting to where he wanted, he'd start the process over again. And he would start to sketch and we would tear models apart, or actually his modeling department would tear models apart over and over again. 
And um, he, he just kept doing that kind of a do loop, which was, uh, I think, part of the real success of how the designs ultimately came out. What, for us, uh, working with models for a builder is really a powerful thing, and it's kind of being shunted away nowadays. Uh, you know, people are going off to electronic design and kind of depending on that electronic design to carry everything, and models I don't see as much anymore. But they're a huge ad advantage to a builder, especially if you're building in stone, to be able to look at something three-dimensionally and really understand what you're trying to accomplish so that we can be crit critical about it if we need to be, about what can be done and what can't be done. And another thing that Larry did, which added a lot to the projects that we built with him and the projects he built, was his ability to communicate with the basic field people. He had a habit of walking, you know, he would walk right past me because he didn't need me at some point. And he would walk out to my foreman, and he knew them by name, and he would, he would call them out and ask them what they thought, ask them how it was going. Did they think this was a good idea? Was this really going to work out? And he'd listen to their feedback, and he'd act on it if he, if he felt that it wasn't really going to the direction he wanted. And, and that did two things. It, it uh, gave him the interface, but it also brought a huge loyalty from our crews. I mean, my guys would do handstands for Larry. They would do things they would do for no one else. And, and uh, that's just that simple act of, of having the, the respect for the person that's actually building things. And, I, you know, I would encourage that for everyone. It's, it's a good model. Um, one of the earlier projects that Larry worked on, I think, that was a, a hugely built mainly of stone and was a real passion for him was the Haas Promenade in Israel. And um, he, you know, that was a, uh, I think it was coming back to his roots for him. I think it was paying back the country that he loved so much and, and, and from his earlier childhood. And um, I think the project in and of itself was kind of a, a, a beginning of somewhat of a healing process. It was a public project that, that was, had a lot more meaning than just a, a promenade or just a public space. It really had a lot of deep meaning. And um, he had been working uh, with Teddy Kollek, the mayor of Jerusalem, to establish where they were going to do this. They picked a hillside that overlooked the uh, ancient part of the city and had once had an aqueduct running along it. And I think the first thing he established immediately that it had to be stone. Jerusalem had to have a stone language in its public spaces. So this project had to be built of stone. And the second thing he saw was the tremendous uh, language of stonemasons in Israel and in the Middle East. There is a very old tradition there. It's still alive. The masons are still there. They're still practicing the same way. They're still using the same tools. And he honed in on that immediately and made it part of his project and you know, really designed to it. Um, he, again, the sketching, the same process, the sketching, the modeling, the going through this, this slow process of, of coming to what eventually is going to be built. And for us, his ability to understand from a stonemason's perspective that the quarries are what drives us, the, the base of the stone. If we don't have good stone, you're not going to get a good project. So he was always at the quarries. He was at the source. He worked from there. He understood it when we were talking about that. He got why we wanted to be there. Um, stone wasn't a commodity. It was, it was part of the spiritual part of the design to, to Larry. And uh, again, you know, throughout his career, he had the ability to sit and talk with the simplest of people doing what was, you know, the simplest of things uh, in terms of, you know, working on a project like this. And, and he had the way to communicate that back into the actual project, into the physical thing itself. These finishes are interesting in this, for us because in my travels worldwide now over a long period of time, I see these same finishes going across cultures, and Larry and I had some really great discussions about that. Um, you know, these finishes may be called boasted in, in Ireland, and in, uh, in Israel, in the Middle East, they may be what's called a taltesh finish. There's different names for them, but, and they use similar but slightly different tools, but they get the same finish, and that is the language of stonemasons. And we understand that. We see it all the time. We understand how the tools are used. We understand how to accomplish it. 
And um, the really great places that you go to, the places that, you, that stick with you, very often will have stone that shows the mark of the hand of man on it. And that is how we relate to what we build. And it's how we relate to the things that last and, and will last forever. And the other thing that Larry had that was really great was a, a, a really strong sense of detail. Um, he, would, he would agonize over one stone with us, about one bench, one, one little thing that he just had to have right, and he had to have it just so. And he would, could tell when it wasn't that way. And um, you know, part of the great privilege that I had working with Larry is uh, we both seemed to have kind of a, a basic understanding of that. And, and it, it wasn't hard for us, it wasn't hard for me to understand that. And, and we worked well that way together. I have not been to uh, this project in Israel. Um, I've only seen the photos of it, and I've seen some of the stones that Larry brought back from it, and we spent time talking about it. But from everyone that's been there and traveled there, it's, it's really a, a landmark in, in um, Jerusalem. The next major project in Larry's career, in the especially the, that's centered in stone, is the FDR Memorial. Um, the, uh, the FDR was, I think, probably what he's most known for. It's one of his most famous projects. It was a 25-year, possibly longer, sojourn for him to go through, uh, how many Congresses is that? Five, five Congresses uh, to get that project approved. And um, in 1974, his design was finally selected by the Art Commission. Um, and as you can see here, it fits in the Macmillan plan for uh, Washington, D.C. Stretches along the Cherry Walk from the Tidal Basin. He created four uh, great outdoor rooms that move you through FDR's life, stage by stage. And um, again, you know, for Larry, the, the critical thing was the stone from the beginning. And, um, I, he began the track with Cold Springs Granite, working with Carnelian Granite, and that was the stone that he chose for the project and that he, he, he wanted this built from. And they got two tracks going because he realized that he had to have that moving along with the general construction of the project or they would never come together at the right point. So, um, you know, again, my experience with Larry, and I know it was true on this project, um, is that he, he got into those quarries and he looked at the stone and he worked with the stone people directly early on, gave us a chance to have a lot of input. Um, in this picture, there's Paul Scardina, who was his uh, key architect in his office and project manager for the FDR Memorial. Paul's with us tonight. And um, he's going to come back and tell me all of the facts that I have twisted sideways <laughs> in this presentation later on. So if you want to get the actual story, you can get it from Paul. But this is my interpretation of it. Um, and, uh, you know, so from our, I, I think that Larry, and especially in FDR, he, the second piece of that was the artists and his ability to work with those artists and bring them into the project and make them such a living part of that entire monument. It was kind of a new thing. Uh, I think for Washington, D.C., it was something that didn't, didn't kind of follow the norm that was going on in Washington. Um, he uh, brought on John Benson, who is probably the best stone letterer alive today, and um, they developed the language that was going to be used in this stone for the FDR memorial. And um, one of the great difficulties of being a stone letterer is working on uneven or split face stone. It's, it's really the highest art. And everything that I saw that John did at the FDR Memorial was absolutely stunning. The letters follow your eye, the speed of the reading, uh, all of the intricacy details to make that experience work on stone is just incredible. And every single artist that Larry brought into the project had that same uh, ability to work on the project, had the same license with him to work directly with him. They used uh, 4,000 blocks of granite, uh, up to 40 tons in size, and they had 9,000 piles that were driven under the project uh, when it was built. 
And um, I, I think it was stunning for Washington when it opened. Um, both my wife and I, Missy, were there at the opening, and um, my oldest son was walking through it with, uh, with us, and his comment was that uh, he said, Dad, this seems like Larry brought a piece of California out here to Washington. And I thought that was a great comment on his part, and it really is how it reads there. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, if you're in Washington, I really would strongly recommend that you get by to see it. And um, just following the completion of the FDR um, in 1996, we came to the point that um, my career really kind of intersected strongly with Larry's office at that point. We had been building some estate gardens prior to that together. And uh, we had worked on one public project, which was Alcatraz Island, uh, the Agave Trail, the restoration of the western side of the island. Um, but we hadn't really worked on any major, major public projects yet together. And uh, in 1996, the, um, uh, the Yosemite Valley Fund came to Larry and, and approached him to redesign the Yosemite Falls area. Uh, it had been damaged. It was subsequently damaged in the floods. And uh, it was really kind of a mess. I mean, it had been in a lot of public uh, papers and articles being written about the state of Yosemite at that point. And they had raised enough money that they really wanted to make an impact. So uh, Larry began his process of public, uh, you know, public input. Uh, this is kind of what the site looked like when he arrived. It was basically a parking lot. And uh, the view was not very good of the falls at that point. Um, he began the process of going through and uh, hiking the loop and meeting with public people and starting to get his ideas coalesced of you know, how they could approach this project and, and actually turn it into something. Uh, again, you know, he spent a lot of time sketching there, and I think that you know, started to develop the ideas that were going to be used. And at about that, as that process was unfolding, he began to talk with me about what the stone could be and what we were, where we would be headed with it. And our discussions leaned uh, kind of towards the WPA, and we began talking about the idea of, of modeling the stonework on what was done during the 1930s by the Works Project Administration. It is um, really, I think, some of the greatest stonework that we've done in this country because uh, they, they had a freedom to work back then, and they, they just worked with the, the local ingredients, and they really used them powerfully. And it seemed that Yosemite had gotten away from that. It seemed Yosemite was kind of going down this track of building things that looked more like they had been belonged somewhere else. And so the bottom line to our beginning work together was trying to make something that would seem like we weren't there, and that was where we kind of lived on that. The centerpiece to his design was to get the trail realigned on the falls so that's, that as you arrive, you look directly down and you see the falls ahead of you, and then to, to widen it and make seating areas and amphitheaters and places that people could sit and get out of the traffic. There's a lot of people there on any given summer day, and, um, but, but unobtrusive, kind of low-key, um, not, you know, not too amped up, more or less. The other uh, need that he had to address was the ADA. Um, part of this plan was to get people all the way around uh, in a wheelchair, and that took a great deal of planning to do that. It's a long trail, and it's a lot of obstacles in the way. Um, so you know, he had to work with both of, of those needs and, and meet them, which I think he did admirably. And we, again, for our pers perspective as stonemasons, uh, we come back to the models because that's the thing that spoke to us the strongest. Um, it gave us the feeling of what we were going to try to accomplish with stone up there. Uh, we, we sourced a local stone. Obviously, we can't go open the quarry in Yosemite and start hacking granite out of the side of, uh, of, a big, of the uh, dome. That's not really going to happen. So we found a local source up by the highways, basically a big pile of granite, and uh, I had my son take a jackhammer out there and spend most of his two summers away from college jackhammering granite boulders. 
Um, and uh, we just kind of took the, the native material and, and, we, and we, you know, we worked it up until the point where we could get it to actually come together and look like something. And uh, the other thing that we did here, w working on all of Larry's projects, everything that we worked on in public and private, we're trying to design and build stone to the 250 year mark at least. So we tried to design and engineer these structures so that we could be confident that, that they were going to be there 250 years from now as a minimum mark. And, and quite frankly, we feel that they could stand for 500 or you know, longer years. These are very solidly built. We do that uh, with a method called coffer building. So we're building dry stack or mortar stack uh, true masonry structures that can stand on their own and then we're coring them and filling them with a structural concrete that's reinforced and we're tying them together with uh, stainless steel usually. So they're waterproof, they're solid, they're one monolithic structure. It costs more, it takes longer to do that, but in public works um, this is where you want to go because it, it, you know veneers and claddings and stuff are fine for residences and things but not for things that are meant to last in the public domain for a long time. And, you know, the other thing, again, Larry had the, all of this uh, years of experience. It was easy for us to show him good stone and have, for him to understand. It was easy for him to go to owners and say, you have to pay what it costs to get good stone. We have to start with that. You can't shortcut that. And for us as Masons, that was a huge thing. I mean, that gave us the ability to, to get up and over and actually do something. And then, you know, the last thing is the time that he would spend with us in, in the field, just kind of, you know, moving boulders around and making details fit and, and uh, you know, trying out ideas with us, which we always left room in our, in our estimates for that, and um, we always ran over. <laughs> but uh, it was fun running over an enjoyable process. And um, again, you know, the, the purpose of this was to leave behind something simple, elegant, uh, looks like it'd been there, built in the 1930s, and I think we got that done. And, uh, you know, all the reports that I get from people that are up there constantly and using it is it's holding up well, looks great, and, um, you know, people, I often tell people we worked on it and they go, worked well on what? Where? I don't, I don't, I never saw anything. And I say, great, perfect. Um, one of the things that Larry did with us quite a bit was, again, the, the sketching in the field to solve problems, which is, uh, I talk a lot to young architects. I get called out to talk to younger architects, and I'm constantly telling them, if you're going to do anything, take a sketching class. You don't have to be great at it, but be good enough that you can communicate on paper in the field at speed is a huge tool, and Larry was really good at it. And he could just sketch something out and give it to us or copy it and hand it to one of our people, and we could take that and go solve the problem. And if it didn't work, we could come back and recycle it with him really quickly. You know, we could talk to him and say, well, that's not going to work, and we would go back and do it again. So that simple thing just moved the projects along, and it kept them from stalling and getting bogged down in these long processes of doing, you know, RFIs and submittals and on and on and on. I, I just uh, I think that the whole industry would be well served by that for architects to have that in their tool pouch. Um, and I mean, that's a great example of it. That just imagine turning that pathway around that boulder. Y there's no way we could lay it. You could lay it out on paper all day long, and it would never work out in the field. And that was pretty much done to the greater extent by just sketching and adjusting in the field. The backsides of the trail were built by the Yosemite Trail Crew, which was a huge asset to the project. It made it possible. There was no way they could afford to have us set all of the stone on that, uh, se what was it, seven miles, Paul? Or two and a half, two and a half, three miles total? Two and a half, two and a half, three miles. No way they could afford it. And uh, the trails crew is excellent. Uh, the work they do up there and the teaching the kids, we've had some of their kids on crew it's a fantastic program. If you've got really fired up teenagers hanging around, you want to do something great with them, send them up to the Conservation Corps trail program up in Yosemite. It'll make men of them, and the girls too. It'll make men of the girls, actually. <laughs> great girls, great stone-setting girls on that crew. 
And finally, that's uh, the bus stop. I think it's kind of the, the centerpiece of the project for us. It was, uh, it was you know, really the, the, the heart of what we were doing up there. Um, I had, when we were building it, um, we were fenced off from the public, and there was a time during one of the periods that we were building, there was a, a, an older German couple that came by every day and stood there. I was up there working for about two weeks. And they stood there for every day for like an hour to two hours, and I finally went up to them and I asked them if they spoke English. They said yes a little. And I said, well, I see you here every day, you know, and it's great, you know, I'm just talking to you, where are you from, and so forth. And he told me that his father was a stone, his grandfather was a stonemason, and that uh, standing there reminded him of being with his grandfather, and that he had never could imagine that anybody in America could do stonework like his grandfather did, and that this, this work reminded him of his grandfather. And I, it was a great moment for us, for me personally, and, and being up there in Yosemite. Um, Yosemite really is a cathedral for stonemasons to work in. It was a huge privilege for us to have been able to do that job with Larry. My standard joke for this slide is that we only uh, did the work in the front. We didn't do the work in the back. The next project that Larry and I worked on together was uh, the Letterman Digital Arts Center in San Francisco. And... Um, this, this came right on the heels of Yosemite. Uh, these were th a group of three major projects, which will end with Stern Grove, but kind of Letterman was kind of in the middle. So we were kind of rolling through one project, going right into pre-construction on another one. And um, my initial discussion with Larry in terms of stone on this project was that um, he wanted it to be kind of sweet. He wanted it to be kind of uh, warm and soft and sweet. That's exactly what he told me. And I said, okay, um, let me go find some warm, sweet stone, and <laughs> I'll, I'll see what I can do about that. And, um, you know, he was just starting and kind of deeply getting into it. The site wasn't much to look at when they got there, and there were some big buildings that had to be built to accommodate uh, this project. And the buildings were fairly nondescript. I know that the architects that designed them would have me hung if I said that in public, but they weren't the real drive of the project. Uh, Larry and George Lucas were working directly closely together. And um, I think that the first thing that Larry did with the project that was really important uh, was he told George that he had to put the parking underground. He said, you gotta get rid of the cars. The parking has to go underground. And that's like a $50 million ticket and no problem for Mr. Lucas. And, um, and then the next thing was uh, in citing the buildings was to get the sight lines aligned to the, the landmarks, which would be the Palace of Fine Arts, Golden Gate Bridge, et cetera. So those two, uh, those two items that were accomplished early in the design set the tone for the park and, and created a really beautiful environment there where the, you know, the park is uh, aligned correctly on those views and it's really nice to walk through. Um, Larry wanted to get kind of a, a, a Marin County feel, watershed, creek kind of uh, man-made but very natural looking water course that would run down through the park and end in a small lake. And so we began the search for stone. We looked in Mexico first and, and we looked at some Mexican stones that we thought would work. They really weren't going to fill the bill. And ultimately, um, what I found was a Northern California fieldstone, but what we went with was the fieldstone that's base is sandstone. Uh, there's quite a bit of volcanic stone that's used in landscaping locally, and it's kind of a hard kind of a, a stone, and I, I felt it was going to be too rough for the project. And we lucked out, and we were able to find two large ranches up in Northern California that had, uh, they're about 6,000 acres each, and the owners were willing to lease part of the ranches to us and allow us to collect stone on them. And uh, there was enough stone that it wasn't going to be an environmental disaster or it wasn't going to have any real negative impacts. So that's what we did. And um, we began immediately building mock-ups. Uh, we went almost like, from my perspective, Larry was working on plans and models with the Lucas organization, but in our case it was really just quick sketches. Let's start building some walls until we get something that looks the way he wants it to look. And um, uh, 
once we got to a point, um, I said, well, why don't we just go up to the ranch and, and we can bring that stone down, we can work there, it's easier and faster. So we had Larry up in the, the ranches a few times and we actually built mock-ups right there. Um, it was really about fitting together stone in a, in a really artistic way, but to make it look natural so that it just didn't look like somebody had done a Walt Disney water course in the middle of a park in San Francisco. And the other thing that we did in that period of time was we took a trip up in the spring to the Mount Tam watershed uh, with my superintendents, the guys that were going to build the job, and we uh, walked the streams with Larry because he was very interested in the sound of the water. It wasn't just the look of it, but he wanted to have the musical notes and how are we going to create them and how are we going to get the sound of the gravel running in it and, you know, deep sounds and shallow sounds. This was really important to him in the whole design. And uh, the best way that I could figure out to get it to happen was to get my guys tuned in to that. Um, I had my son Dylan, who's a musician, along with me. Um, you know, we were saying, well, that's an D flat, isn't it? <laughs> so, I think it is. Um, but it, it, these were the kind of background things that made the difference between just kind of building something from a set of plans and actually making something special. And um, it takes that kind of work to do it. The other thing that Larry did was this, again, the whole stream was kind of choreographed or scripted as, uh, you know, scored rather, I'm sorry, scored as he said. And, um, you know, he had, he had all of these little sections where he'd have like, a, I want a rill here and I want the water to go underground here. I want it to reemerge here. I want us to have more water here and less water there. And I know Paul and I just really went crazy trying to figure out the mechanics of all that as well because, you know, the, the physical mechanical systems were pretty complicated to make it all happen. But um, more than anything, it was just the, the, the shapes and the sizes of the stone and the way we put them together. And along with uh, small scale models that my guys kept at the site and worked from constantly, uh, we then got the, actually got the stone out, and we're talking about three or four thousand tons of stone that came down onto the site eventually. And you know the logistics of that are fairly complicated, but the end result was if you go out and, and just walk there when the stream is running during the day, it's just kind of a simple country stream, and it's not too pretentious, and it's very pleasant to be around, and people seem to really love it. And you know it took all of that effort to get to that place and to make that. The other thing that we did there was we wanted to demonstrate as much as we could the stonemason's craft. We used large stones in the walls, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half ton stones, and we fit them tight. And we, we wanted to show people, um, you know, what, what I think really great stone, tight stone masonry should look like. And we were given the budget to do it, and, and Mr. Lucas was patient enough with us the time-wise to do it as well. And again, we use that coffer system here. So these walls are, are massively solid. They're, they're welded together. They'll never come apart unless you took them with a jackhammer or something. It's a great bird that landed that day up there. And, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot on the project in terms of um, you know, it's very difficult to get a large crew of stonemasons, 30, 40 guys, to work together in, in an artistic manner like this. So one of the big learning things for me was, I mean, it's, it's, it's easier for me when I have, you know, my son and five or six guys that I've worked with for 25 years and we just go out to do something. It's a lot harder when you have 30 or 40 guys. And at this time, we were also two or three of these large projects going at once. So... Uh, and you can't lose control of that. So that was a really hard thing. And what it taught me was to, to get really great guys and to trust them and to let them work with Larry directly and to relax and just let that process go. And, that's, and he recognized that, and we talked about it. And, and I said, you know, you, 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 it can't be about me. I, I'm going to be in six different places. It's got to be about Jason Joplin, one of our foremans, or David Elkington, or one of the great guys we have. And, and they've got to have that interface. They've got to be able to talk to you and understand what you're going to do. And they did, and they did a fantastic job. It wasn't, you know, my part of it was doing what I do here is talking and walking around and uh, trying to deal with vendors. Um, the last 
great project that we got to do with, with Larry was Stern Grove. And for me, in my career, I think it's, it's a date, it's the most fantastic thing that I've ever gotten a chance to work on. Um, from my perspective in Stern Grove, uh, when I came into it, in my conversations with Larry early on was that he said, well, on this project, I want to create a sculpture of stone. I want this to be a sculpture. He said, this entire project needs to be a sculpture. And it's not just about one stone or setting a stone or doing a mason's craft. He said, I want this to be my sculpture. And he said, I want my hands and I want to be involved in it and I want to guide it and direct it very specifically. And, um, you know, the, the, the work it started uh, with uh, Richard Goldman and Doug Goldman, uh, they simply had Larry to one of the concerts, Stern Grove concerts, if you haven't been to them at that po point, in that point in time, the Stern Grove was just kind of a grassy hillside that people slid down while they tried to eat their lunch. And uh, it, wonderful concerts. I mean, the Goldmans do a fantastic thing for San Francisco. They, we have free summer concerts all summer long of some of the best entertainers in the world. I mean, there's not many cities that have that amenity. And uh, so it's a fantastic amenity for San Francisco. And Richard Goldman and Larry were sitting and having lunch, and Larry's, of course, sketching away, and they're talking about ideas. And, um, you know, from that, sketches on lunch bags, uh, the Goldmans got excited and decided to put the funding together and get behind the idea of really improving this and building a, a great Western amphitheater. One of the, you know, there's very few of them get built nowadays. Uh, it lies 100 feet below the surface of the street, so it's a big, deep, uh, man-made uh, valley down there. And um, Stern Grove has been using it for over 68 years, so it's been around for a long time. The facilities were in really bad shape. And Larry's initial sketches were of kind of an open meadow type of amphitheater. Um, this is what the site looked like when he arrived. And I think that the amphitheater design, from my perspective, is grounded in kind of the traditional uh, historical amphitheaters. but they took it kind of to a new place. They opened it up they, and made it more park-like so it wasn't just this massive stone structure that people would trip over. Um, and uh, I think that he was very, you know, Larry was very aware of the environment down there. It's a, it's a kind of a strange environment. You know, it doesn't get warm there all the time. It's sometimes very cold. And they also needed a new stage and new backstage facilities. Uh, and Larry wanted to develop uh, a, a plenum for the, for the stage, which he felt was really important to, to ground the whole thing. So the design was moving ahead rapidly as we were moving through the Lucas project. Um, I, I did timing wise, I'm not quite sure where they landed. I think we had both going at the same time. For a while. Yeah, for a while we did, that's true. Um, <clears throat> What I told Larry and I told the Goldmans, I said, if we're going to do this, um, I have to get on the stone right away from the first time the idea was brought to me. I went on a kind of a worldwide search. I went to Canada. I looked at some quarries there. I didn't see anything that I really liked. I brought back uh, a few American stones that we considered, but they weren't really lighting uh, the fuse. I had been working in China extensively on another project. And uh, I, in my travels, I found a small quarry up in Shandong, China that had a uh, dark gray-green granite that had a beautiful golden patina to it as well. So I brought that back. Larry saw it. He loved it. He thought it was great. The other thing that drove me on this, uh, the particular stone, was that this quarry was huge, and they had massive uh, overburden piles. Like, you were talking a million or two million tons of stone piled up in hundreds of acres of land out there. And every one of these stones looked like a sculpture. I mean, they were just broken huge shards of stone, uh, massive pieces. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of photographs for Paul and Larry and the staff, and they went through them, and everybody could see that this quarry was going to be perfect. And the stone just really looked like it belonged in San Francisco. It was the right color. So um, we started right away with the sourcing process. We started building uh, mock-ups here in the U.S., and I started building them in China at the same time because I needed the Chinese to understand how we were going to do this. It was totally out of their experience. They'd never done business with an American company. They'd never shipped any stone anywhere outside of China. This was a local quarry. This was a small communist commune that had been converted 
at the time of uh, you know when the when the great uh, up revolution I mean the um, forgot the name of it sorry but when China kind of modernized these communes all of a sudden are on their own and so we had these great village highly motivated people but they couldn't understand us from Adam they were they just were like we got rocks what do you want what do you want to do with them <laughs> so uh, I, I was traveling back and forth a fair amount and um, you know, I would come in and work with Larry and his team to try to get where the plan was at. And then when I was making my returns to China, I was trying to get them up to speed so that they would be um, ready for this project. Because we're going to have seven months to build it over the winter. Uh, it had to open the next spring. Um, it was going to be a long, you know, really fast track. And uh, so fortunately, the Goldmans were great clients and they allowed us the uh, flexibility. They gave us the money and the budget to move forward with the stone. So um, Larry, at this point, was developing small uh, mock-ups and models that we used to build here with. And he was also giving me some that I could travel with. And I was taking these back to China. And I was saying, well, we're going to need 130 sculptural boulders. And Larry has literally molded each one of these boulders out of clay and, and what he wants them to look like. So you guys need to go out there in that million pounds of stone, and you need to find exactly that. And, and uh, that was the assignment. So um, I have some really uh, fantastic Chinese partners. And what happened there was really a, a unique thing in that uh, they took Larry's drawings and models. And they, in order to have you know, 10 or 15 guys kind of searching out over these great big area to find all these stones, they turned them into ideas. So they made them pictographs. So they would say, well, that's a, that's a squatting limestone. That's, you know, that looks like a squatting line. And, oh, this one looks like a, a royal soldier stone. Yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's that. And the, using the pictographs and his drawings, they, they did all of that. And we made sheets for everybody. And they could just go out in the fields and they'd go rambling around. And they'd find something. And you have to go in with a, a cable crane, which means you're dragging four or 500 feet of cable off of an old steam donkey out into the Netherlands. And you wrap it and you have to drag it out of the pile. If it's not the right stone, you've got to go get another one. So they, they got into a rhythm of bringing these stones down to a yard where we could look at them, and, and we would then show them, well, that one's good. No, that one's not good. And, and eventually, they got really good at it. And they got all of those stones selected. And we had about two months to do it. And they got it done and got them loaded. And along with that, we needed a lot of wall stone. There, there's quite a bit of walling in the project. It's all dry stack walling. And um, there was no way that we could build this project in seven months. And, and with the manpower we had, we had 50 masons on it. But even at that, it wasn't. There's no way that we could split three or four thousand tons of granite by hand in seven months and build all of this ourselves. So we used an 80-20 rule, and we taught the Chinese how to make the shapes close to what we needed, but not finish them. And so that 80 percent of the work got done in China, and it left our guys with about 20 percent of the work that needed to be done here. And that's how we solved the problem. And um, we got everything here, and we got going with Larry. And of course, it's a mud pit down there in the middle of the winter. And um, it also turned out to be one of the second wettest winters in the history of San Francisco. <laughs> it's helpful. Uh, so you know, essentially, it was a classic all-American mud fest, slam dunk, concrete, or holy macro construction project for most of those seven months. Um, but I think that between the Chinese crews and the American crews that they really, uh, they almost perfectly accomplished what Larry had modeled. This isn't a model here of the clay model of the ziggurat that Larry wanted built. This is us assembling the ziggurat in China in the middle of the winter, by the way, which was uh, Shandong drops to about 11 degrees average at that time of year. Uh, but these guys are knocking it out. And these are big pieces, maybe two and a half, three and a half tons a piece. And that is Andrew's, Andrew setting. Well, I don't know if he was setting the stone, but he was taking a picture with it. Um, but that was the finished product, and, and that's it finished. And I, I think that, I mean, from a clay model to that, it's almost an exact uh, representation of what Larry wanted. And I, I think that was the nature of us trying to achieve this idea of sculpture in, in stone in a large-scale project. And um, 
We finished the project on time. It was on budget, which surprised the hell out of me. <laughs> and I think that it's a, a great addition to San Francisco and a great public amenity. Um, there'll be a gathering there in the year 2030, if I'm still around. Paul, if you're still here, we have a time capsule buried out there, uh, location not to be disclosed. And uh, along with a lot of great notes and stuff, there's a bottle of 20-year-old whiskey, which will be a nice 50, 60-year-old bottle by the time we get back to it. And uh, we intend to enjoy that. Uh, the great joy that my company and myself got out of this project, along with doing it with Larry and having the privilege of doing it, was um, building something that w the public could appreciate. About 80% of our work gets built and locked behind gates, and no one ever sees it except for some extremely wealthy people. And uh, this is a project that we got to go down, and we can sit with 12 or 13,000 of our uh, friends and colleagues and neighbors and uh, enjoy music and great days. So that was a great joy for us. And um, essentially, that's you know the crux of the work that I did with Lawrence Halpern. <laughs>